Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I will speak about drones and their possible attack vectors. Uh, I want to um, say thank you to all the people that helped me with my research and that spent a lot of time uh, with me on the field trip to test all uh, the attack scenario that I will show you later. So, um, let me introduce uh, myself. I'm Paolo Stagno. I'm better known on the internet as uh, Voidsec. And since the beginning of my career, um, I mainly dealt with penetration tests and red team, while now uh, in DoyenSec, I'm moving towards the application security and uh, vulnerability research. Uh, I also own uh, a blog that is called voidsec.com, where I publish my articles, uh, research, and vulnerabilities. So I'm sorry, I know that some of you were expecting uh, like this, but I will not speak about it. Well, uh, uh, the talks is divided in, well, three main uh, blocks. The first one uh, about vulnerability research on that topics, um, the reverse engineering part, and the forensics. So uh, first, the, um, since the first introduction uh, in the consumer markets, drones were um, used by different type of uh, um, for sectors like the law enforcement for, uh, you know, border control, patrolling, and so on. And uh, um, another um, project um, where drones were used as a um, portable uh, defibrillator. And also by, um, you know, checking place where there are hard to, to get by a human. And also in 2017 uh, in uh, Syria, um, they were used uh, um, to drop some explosive projectiles on uh, the battlefield. And personally, I used drone uh, in uh, red team engagement uh, to map Wi-Fi hotspot in the area and later to generate um, a map of the Wi-Fi hotspot. So in this panorama, a Chinese company named DJI quickly gained the fame and reputation as the most stable um, aerial platform for shooting and, and video and photos. And um, this is the Phantom 3 model, and this is the product on which all my research and this talk is based on. Uh, it took me something like uh, one year of research, um, working in my spare time, night time. And so, um, uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, you can see the main body of the aircraft and its controller and some other equipment. So. These are some key points of this specific uh, model, speaking about its weight. Its weight, uh, 1.2 kilograms, and this is able to fly with another 400 grams of payload. Uh, it can fly for 20, 25 minutes, uh, really depending on the weather condition, and its maximum speed is uh, 16 meters per second, or 57 uh, kilometers per hour. And uh, as I mentioned it earlier, um, it is an excellent platform for its stability. Now, I'm joking, this is the video feedback of um, a race drone. While, um, yeah, this is the video feedback. Uh, the video footage of a day uh, on the sea, there was a bit of wind, uh, but um, it's really stable. If you pay special attention, you can also see a seagull passing by at one point. I don't know where. Yeah, okay, never mind. Okay, and this is our um, all photos in different type of weather, sun and wine condition. The left corner is uh, uh, Piazza Vittorio in Turin, my hometown, while the two photos in the middle are from UK, and the right corner um, is again uh, Turin and Superg. So speaking about the Phantom 3 model, um, this is uh, uh, all the drone architecture um, that I uh, analyzed. Basically, the drone with his flight controller and some other um, modules like the GPS modules and um, compass, uh, gyroscope, and so on. And their ground controller that is um, a radio module for communicating um, flight command to the drone. And um, the optional, basically, module that is the uh, application that you can mount on the mobile phone and you can retrieve back uh, the video feedback and uh, um, some media while you're shooting photos from the drone. 
And despite all these technological components, the drone doesn't have um, any system to detect obstacle. Uh, so you can only fly the drone in line of sight, basically. So the first thing that I did was to try to understand its network schema. And um, the drone is basically acting as a, um, well, the ground controller is acting as an access point for the drone and the camera. There are mm, two different components, uh, probably because they don't want uh, the video feedback to interfere with the flight controller. And uh, as I said before, optional is the usage of the mobile application on, on the phone. So as you can see, this is the list of all the exposed services within the network um, that I showed you before. So I'm basically having a flying FTP server. And um, the interesting services like SSH and Telnet are uh, filtered, so I cannot connect while the FTP is always uh, reachable. And in the case of the camera, uh, you can log in with the uh, anonymous, anonymous combination. While port 7678 is used by the um, Android iOS application. And this is the uh, Nmap scan of the last uh, version of uh, the firmware. Uh, we can see that they are trying to improve and they're hardening um, the service that they are exposing. So um, they uh, only left the core services and they left the FTP because it's used for uh, loading the new firmware update and retrieve some uh, flight logs and media and the port used by the mobile application. So this hardening was due to the um, contrast the illegal market of uh, um, mod that were allowing people to uh, change, you know, maximum uh, altitude and also remove some uh, no-fly zone limitation from, from, the, from the drone. So, yeah, regarding the communication between the aircraft and the controller, um, a Wi-Fi uh, connection in, is uh, established between uh, um, the remote controller and the drone and is used for both the transport of flight data and the video feedback. So uh, this model uh, does not use the Lightbridge protocol. That is uh, a protocol proprietary for um, long distance streaming. And it has some um, greater stability and fluidity of long range communication. And is uh, mounted on a more professional drone of DJI. And the default uh, SSID is derived from the MAC address of the ground controller and uh, it has the following format. is phantom3 underscore the last six digits of um, the MAC address of the ground controller, while the password is the evergreen strong password 1234, 1234, and this is the default one. So you can change it, but uh, it comes with that password. So uh, obviously drones are not uh, exempt from the most common Wi-Fi attacks. So we have um, some predefined behaviors in the case of uh, the authentication attack. So if we basically disconnect the phone from the, from the ground controller, nothing happens. While if we disconnect the ground controller from the drone, it will trigger the return to home. And the return to home uh, is basically the drone flying uh, um, up to 30 meters of altitude, and after that, uh, uh, going back in a straight line um, where the last GPS point was recorded as a, a home point. So um, this can be only used in uh, uh, where we have GPS uh, fix. And if we try to add a new device uh, to an existing network, the aircraft maintain a queue of device, so there's leaving priority to the first connected phone, and when the connection to the first connected phone drop, and you can now uh, connect the second one. And if you're trying to issue command with the mobile phone and the ground controller at the same time, uh, the ground controller still maintain a kind of priority, but it makes all uh, the system a lot less manageable. And uh, Wi-Fi attacks again. Um, you cannot downgrade the uh, settings to WAP or uh, VPS because it does not have that kind of support, while um, the VPA2 is uh, um, vulnerable to the uh, standard four-way handshake brute force. And since, as we will see later, uh, the system is based on uh, OpenWRT, 
and DJI never released a firmware update after the crack advisory. It is also vulnerable to crack. And this is uh, an example of the four-way um, and shake brute force. I was using Fluxion, um, a good dictionary, and it's just a matter of some minutes to recover the pressured password. Okay, um, from here, I started my, uh, my journey into getting a shell on the aircraft system. Um, because at the moment, uh, I have some uh, filtered services for which I do not have any password. Uh, so the first things that come to my mind was to explore the application that DJI provide for video feedback and some other uh, assist assisted control. Okay, here a small digression. Um, the Phantom 3 and later models comes with a geofencing system or an inbuilt no-fly zone list. And no-fly zone are, as shown uh, by the image, some virtual fences with uh, a specific diameter which the drone cannot fly in. So this makes possible to exclude some location, like the airport, from drone flights. And DJI also has a, a map. You can uh, um, see country by country all the no-fly zone in the area. And there are three different types of no-fly zone. The first one is a warning zone uh, in green, uh, where user will be just prompt with a warning message. And the second zone is in yellow, and this is uh, an authorization zone. So you will need to have a verified DJI account and internet connection, and you will get a prompt on your mobile phone, and you can unlock the, this area for the flight. While in red, there is the restricted zone, so there are zones where you cannot fly, and the flight is forbidden, so if you try to turn on the drone, uh, it will refuse to start. So main problem is that no-fly zone system is only available when GPS coverage is present. So if the drone is not aware of its position, it can fly inside no-fly zone. Uh, while if you, trick, if you try to trick um, the drone, putting it in, in attitude mode, while it is still having the GPS fix, it will refuse to fly. And um, this is an example because um, DJI want to update no-fly zone, like including uh, um, temporary no-fly zone for specific events or location. So um, it is able to push some new no-fly zone during the mobile app updates. And in this is example, this is uh, the example of a uh, no-fly zone file. In blue, you can see the uh, position and radius of the no-fly zone while in red, uh, the type of the no-fly zone. So this is a stadium, and the flight is not permitted. In violet, you can also see um, the date where the no-fly zone were inserted, uh, and also if it's temporary, when it begins and when it ends. While in green, the name and the city where the no-fly zone is present. So main problem is um, that these resources are not signed, so you can edit them and basically invalidate all the introduction of this, no, of this new no-fly zone. And searching inside the application, I also found this configuration file with the root password for the aircraft. And you know, the password is Big China, is a Chinese product. And they're also trying to improve because in the previous model, it was only digits, so they are trying at least. Okay, so perfect. Now I have the password, but uh, um, SSH and Telnet are still filtered, and FTP service is restricted to a single folder, so I cannot navigate the file system. Yeah, damn. So I tried some simple firmware uh, replacement, but the firmware has some kind of checksum mechanism that prevent me to replace it. And uh, since doing the full uh, firmware analysis uh, um, would have been a long process, and I'm lazy. I prefer to, uh, you know, um, perform some preliminary um, analysis. As an example, I tried to just grab for some simple keywords, and I was able to extract some other hashes that I cracked. So now I'm full of user and password, but I cannot log in anywhere because the services are, are filtered. 
So I also thought that um, some of the countermeasure of uh, the firmware were, uh, um, you know, introduced in later updates. So if, even if it's not documented, I found that if you keep press the three small line uh, in the application, basically a new menu will pop out, and from this menu uh, you can uh, downgrade the firmware. So I downgraded the firmware, and downgrading the firmware, um, the FTP service was not uh, longer limited. So as a root uh, account, I was able to access the entire file system, which I copy, and uh, I started the analysis again. So the specific system uh, that DJI is using for this drone is a fork of uh, OpenWRT that is called Barrier Breaker, and it's also full of uh, some custom binary for, from DJI. So I also found that the following scripts are running at the boot time, and they are holding some uh, network configuration for the Wi-Fi settings and stuff. So um, I had this command, and I was able to reactivate the, the telnet, and that was the result. So I was finally able to get root on the aircraft. That's fine, but uh, it's not everything, because uh, uh, until now, I basically ignored some uh, of the three big chunks that DJI provide, um, and that third big chunks is the SDK. SDK, here I have some sad story for you. The first time that I tried to compile it, I got back something like 11,000 error message, but at the end I was made it to work, you know, with some hammering technique. So the main idea of SDK attack was uh, uh, to isolate some specific instruction um, sent to the drone and while monitoring, you know, the um, network traffic with Wireshark or whatever, and um, I would like to implement some custom application that could send specific command to the drone, like the association to another Wi-Fi uh, uh, network, in order to get a full drone takeover. So SDK has also an unlock mechanism that is mm, required to have, again, a DJI account and request an API. But fortunately, in the, la in the version that is prior to the last one, um, it was enough to modify the Java bytecode and set the variable as, um, uh, you know, unlocked SDK, like setting the variable to number two, uh, if I remember correct, yeah. And uh, so you, you don't need the AP key anymore and you don't need a DJI account. And also, uh, this is the communication flow between uh, the application and the drone. Uh, I filtered out all the uh, UDP traffic uh, because it's only video feedback. So I also started to do some reverse engineering of the um, DJI uh, SDK uh, packets. And DJI use a proprietary TCP-based protocol for flight control. So I started to do some reverse engineering, and it's very similar to the protocol that uh, was used by the previous version of the um, Phantom. So some fields were already uh, been identified by the community, and this is as uh, one example of a DJI packet. It has an header of four bytes and a payload of variable length. For the header, the first byte is uh, a protocol magic number, and the second uh, byte is um, the packet length, so the either plus the payload. After that, there is uh, the version of the SDK, and uh, the last byte is a custom DJI CRC, which I derived from our coded values um, inside the SDK. While this is the payload structure, so uh, we have the source type, in our case is the application, speaking with the remote controller, after that, we have an incremental sequence ID, uh, a flag a field that I don't know uh, for which it's used, and the command that is being issued to the drone. So in this case, is remote controller command set, uh, another ID, and after that, um, the meaning of the payload. So we are setting some kind of uh, um, specific instruction of, uh, on the remote controller uh, 
uh, of the drone. And that lead me to GPS attack. Um, GPS attack was the attack vector on which I focused mostly, uh, and mainly because uh, it does not require um, you know, to be in the same network as the drone, and it's full remote. And furthermore, it's the most common technique to hijack a civil drone, since uh, civil GPS is not encrypted. And speaking about GPS attack, the most common way um, was the replay attack, where basically a previously recorded signal is sent back to the device. And as a setup, I used the HRF, which is kind of cheap, it's 300 euro, uh, but if you compare it to other devices, it's cheap. So um, the HRF also has uh, some small problem with uh, uh, its internal clock, because it's not precise enough to run uh, GPS replying. So you need to buy an external clock in order to make it work for GPS attack. And to, in order to generate our signal, uh, we need to download some basic data. Uh, and these basic data are called ephemeris data. And they are containing some information about the location uh, as far as I was able to understand, the location, the current location and the future location of a satellite, and they are used by the receiver to calculate the estimated position on, uh, on Earth. And this is the result of GPS spoofing attack, the device now thinking that I'm in Turkey. And um, I would also like to point out that uh, also the time information is contained in uh, the spoofed signal, so we can spoof time and space. And this is the result. Uh, the drone was in Italy, but uh, I was spoofing the location of the White House, that surprisingly is also an off -light zone. And if I try to fly, I got this error message back. So funny things, DJI thinks that uh, the White House is a nuclear power plant. I don't know, maybe we are missing something. But uh, if we spoof the no flight zone, uh, the drone cannot take off. And uh, while if the drone is inside an off flight zone and we are spoofing uh, uh, another location, um, the drone will be unlocked and free to fly. And this is what happens when uh, we are spoofing an off flight zone and the drone is flying. Uh, with my setup, it will require something like uh, 10 minutes or more to complete this attack, so the video is speeded up. And the drone is forced landing if we basically create an on-demand no-flight zone while uh, is flying. And this is the schema that we can use uh, with the right hardware equipment to perform a complete uh, takeover. Basically, the um, real drone is on the green marker, and um, in, at the same time, two different attacks are performed. The first one, that is uh, a deauthentication attack, so we are triggering the return to home functionality in order to get the drone flying back home. And at the same time, we are also performing the GPS spoof attack. So now the drone thinks to be on red marker and try to fly home, uh, while basically the drone is fly on the opposite direction, far more um, away uh, from the home point. So we can capture it or do whatever we want. So I also try to think uh, how we can detect some GPS attack. Uh, with my setup, basically, we can have these three options. Uh, we can validate the GPS subframe. Uh, as you can see from uh, the image, um, a real GPS signal as a subframe with uh, uh, some data, while uh, a GPS spoofed signal as a subframe with all zero. So if we are receiving a um, GPS packet with uh, all zero data in its subframe, we can refuse the packets and uh, uh, we are kind of safe from GPS spoofing attack, at least with my setup. And also, we can try to validate the time that we have set on device uh, with the time that we are receiving from GPS uh, signal. And we can also try to uh, check the speed or validate um, the time spent traveling between uh, two different points. So if the drone is uh, here in Sweden and after one second uh, its location is changed to China and is impossible to fly from Sweden to China in just one second, we should refuse um, you know, the new location. 
So uh, that's pretty much lead to the last block, the forensic part, um, which basically I thought that could be interesting to understand where we can retrieve a forensic artifact from uh, this model and later. So on the phantom tree, there are three locations from which we can recover artifacts. Uh, the first one is the gimbal, um, the camera on the gimbal. So we can recover some media files like the images, video, uh, and so on. And there is an also another location that is the mm, mobile phone on which the app is installed. And there are some TXT files um, on the mobile application. And also there is a third location that is, again, is not documented, but uh, um, there is this memory that is holding that file um, that is present on the motherboard of the drone and is acting like a real um, aircraft black box or uh, flight recorder. So um, DJI again used a proprietary file uh, type for that file and um, since there is already uh, available a tool that is called Drop, drone uh, open source parser that is able to parse that file and retrieve information, I will not spend uh, too much time on that. But as you can see from the structure, again, the first byte is starting like um, the magic number, uh, magic protocol number uh, from the SDK. And again, we are having, uh, you know, the, um, the sensor that is issuing uh, a message and the uh, content of the message. And um, I would also like to know that uh, um, when um, the memory is full, the oldest data uh, will be overwritten. But not only like, uh, you know, deleting the file pointers. Um, well, the precise location of the file that will be overwritten will be zeroed out. So this will reduce uh, the forensic uh, chance of recovering file. And it is also possible, and I was a bit upset when I discovered that, uh, to fly the drone without the memory on the motherboard. So um, uh, flying the drone without this memory uh, will not uh, record anything, and, and this can be used as a, uh, an anti-forensic technique. And if we try to, well, these are all the data uh, that can be extracted from uh, you know, both that file and TXT. File and if we aggregate all this information, we can get something like that. So we can show the fly path of of, um, of the drone with some statistics about um, um, the maximum altitude, speed, and distance from the on point, and we can also get um, the entire sensor signals that uh, um, we had during a, a flight. So in this specific example the signal lost uh, signal is shown. And um, this is the list of all the events that um, are occurred in a specific time frame. So uh, you can see um, that every event are, are also holding uh, the altitude and distance from the home point and some other information. And if we intersect basically all the uh, information that we have, so gimbal data with fly data, and the events where uh, photos or video were taken, it is also possible to reconstruct uh, what the operator of the drone was able to see and photograph. So we can be better than CSA. And um, also, uh, if for that file they will stay on uh, the memory that is on board of the drone, uh, the same things cannot be said for the TXT file. TXT file on mobile phone uh, will be um, uploaded to DJI server because they will be used to feed uh, um, the DJI pilot accounts. So um, with all these details, it's not difficult to understand why uh, US uh, in 2017 banned uh, DJI products uh, from army, so basically they cannot use DJI products inside the army. Uh, that probably was the reason, because uh, you know you will fly the drone, and after that your mobile phone will upload all data uh, on DJI and so Chinese server. Okay, some things that I forgot to say: um, the video feedback on the drone uh, does not have any type of checksum, so we can potentially show on screen. Uh, any type of image. And another thing is the drone is very sensitive to electromagnetic field. 
So it has a compass system and um, it requires calibration before the first flight. And I can tell you from experience that if you're trying to turn on the drone near a fridge or some really large metal masses, uh, the compass will go crazy and will require recalibration. So I think there should have some minutes left. And um, uh, these are all the uh, countermeasures that uh, come up for uh, trying to defend against drone. Uh, some of them are pretty straightforward, like shooting down the drone with a normal gun, and other are, you know, some more fancy kind of uh, defenses. And um, none of them is working against uh, uh, a very tiny drone or uh, um, some drone swarms, so where you have, you know, hundreds of drones flying all together, uh, basically none of them is working. And this is an example of a drone that was developed to capture and neutralize another drone. And after that, they started trying eagles. So, yeah, the problem with eagles is that uh, um, the average life of an eagle is 20 years, but they can only spend 10 years doing this kind of mission. So after you bought one and you spent probably years training them, uh, you will left with probably a best friend, I don't know, because they are quite useless after 10 years, so <laughs> don't know why to bow them. And, um, well, yeah, confetti gun can also be effective. <laughs> or a jet ski. So, yeah, you can feel the pain of the drone operator. It's 4,000 euro, knock it down. And all these fancy, you know, countermeasure when that's what happened in reality. So they hit drone with three million dollar missiles. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Okay, so um, further work. Uh, maybe in the future, uh, I will try to look into two different things. Uh, as I said before, the system is full of custom binary, so I can try to uh, reverse engineering them and trying to find some cool exploit for uh, this binary. And also, I can try to do the full network protocol analysis. So I can try to build a um, ground station that is uh, um, speaking through the SDK directly with the drone, or maybe playing with something that is more complex than that. Okay, here I have some references and useful links for later. And that's all, so. Thanks, that's, uh, that's fun. Um, we're running a bit ahead of schedule, which is, which is nice. Yep. Uh, but that also means that the coffee is not gonna be ready yet when we're done here. So I'm gonna get uh, questions from the audience, but Yep. First thing, um, I'm really curious, is anybody making a better firmware for this? Uh, well, I don't think so. I mean, they released some other version later, so I don't think that the Model 3 will be upgraded anyway. All right, because I, I mean, this, it's an obvious attack thing with the geofencing yeah. to convince it that it's somewhere where it shouldn't be to make it land, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that you would want to remove as a user. Yeah. So sh someone should be making a firmware that you could replace yeah, this Yeah, th they should Exists. make... Yeah? Exists. All right, take the microphone. Are you, are you aware of Ken Kevin Finisterre and the work that he's done? No. So there's a website, dji.retroroms.info. I think okay. it might be hyphenated. But Kevin Finisterre, his nick on Twitter is dot slash D0TSLASH. Okay, so um, they are upgrading the firmware. But it's uh, no, uh, a so community I, I, version, like... Uh, yeah, so like I brought my Mavic, okay. uh, and the, it's got... The controller is patched, mm -hmm. the aircraft is patched, and the Android app is patched, and they've okay. removed everything. Like, it's a proper, <laughs> like, it's, a, it's like a dirt bike now. It's great. So, like, if you're unaware of, uh, yeah, so they've removed all the geofencing. They've removed, like, the entire left-hand side of the application, which just scrolls with errors and whining and complaining. They removed 100% yeah, of the GPS restrictions, all the altitude and distance restrictions. They've let you make it, they make, make, make it go four times faster. Hilarious uh, uh, aside is that one of the exploits they used um, on the aircraft, which runs Android, by the way, yep. um, is the dirty cow exploit works because, <laughs> because of course it does. 
Um, but yeah, if you're unaware of Kevin Finisterre and the work that he's done, it sounds like a whole bunch of the stuff that you're looking for is already done, and there's a wiki, and there's firmwares. Okay, nice. Yeah, so it's pretty rad. You should check it out. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Interesting, but and the, is there somewhere some some mitigation you can do against the GPS hijacking thingy? Probably not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there'd be some things that are unreasonable, right? If you move it really quickly, like the drone can't move that quickly. Yeah, but it would be you know performance issue checking all the packets coming through. I guess only if you're making it do an autonomous flight, because like as you're controlling it with the sticks, like like I'm I'm not sure that the aircraft cares about where it is in GPS if you're using the sticks to control it. If you've programmed a path, yeah, if you program then path, yeah, yeah, then there's nothing much you can do because it's radio and unless you can like, somehow manufacture a Faraday cage to go around your aircraft as it's flying into places it's not supposed to fly, <laughs> like if it can be any more conspicuous, yeah, like no. maybe it shoots fireworks at the same time. Like yeah, well, the main <laughs> attack with uh, GPS will be the authentication, the ground controller from the drone yeah. and spoofing the GPS uh, right. the GPS signal in order to steal the drone. So yeah, yeah. So basically, <laughs> problems and deal with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it'll it'll kill you with a return to home if you lose. Like if you really want to ruin somebody's day, you spray the transmitter with 2.4 gig and you you jam the transmitter. And when the aircraft loses communications with the transmitter, it goes to return to home mode, and the aircraft goes, oh, I better, I guess I better go to my last known GPS location. And then in that condition, you can just conveniently send it out into the ocean, never to be seen again, or something, or into a building, or in, into wherever. But yeah. yeah, if you control the, if you can tell it where it thinks it is via GPS, and then you can create a condition whereby it goes return to home, then you can absolutely exploit it that way, yeah. And there's basically no defense. So, but you made some tools for this. So right. you were creating some tools when you were doing this. Is um, that tools that you make available? No, really, I didn't create any tools. I mean, no? the only tool that is uh, already available is the parser for the dot files. Uh, <laughs> while for the SDK, I honestly didn't build anything. All so right. yeah, it was just a trial and error approach. So I was just recording a lot of uh, packets from the uh, mobile application sent to the drone and looking at the values of the packets in order to try to understand what was changing. So if you, you know, stick the command to make it fly, what bytes change and whatever. So yeah, it's just. All right, fair enough. Do you have questions for the audience? There's a hand over there. Can we get a microphone? Um, I think you've almost answered this already, but if you wanted to steal the drone so you can jam the Wi-Fi and it'll go into go home mode, um, are there any commercial drones that don't do that? Like if they get their Wi-Fi jammed, they'll just sit in place or just immediately go down to the ground? I'm sorry? If you, so if you jam the 802.11 yeah. Wi-Fi, it'll go into return home mode, mm -hmm. and at that point you can potentially spoof the GPS to get it to come to you or yeah, climb that, to a tree Yeah, that's the point where you can spoof GPS, yeah, when so you trigger return to home. Yeah, so are there any commercial drones that don't do return to home if they lose their Wi-Fi link, or do they all do that? Uh, honestly, I only tested DJI products, so DJI products is making the return to home when it lose connection to the home controller, but I don't know for other. Yeah, thanks. More hands? No? All right, that's okay. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you.